Hey guys, welcome to our Friday video. Today we're going back to a very interesting time in processor history. Big Blue, IBM decided to go with Intel processors for their PC, but demanded a second supplier. And the second supplier happened to be AMD. For a while everything was good. An agreement was signed and AMD built processors based on Intel specifications. But of course, this relationship didn't last very long. And with the 386, Intel refused to work with AMD. A huge legal battle kicked off and AMD was busy reverse engineering Intel's 386 processor. But it took them 5 years and Intel had the market all to themselves, setting prices as they pleased without any competition. In the end, the courts sided with AMD and they were granted rights to sell their reverse engineered 386 and also 486 processors. But starting with the Pentium and the AMD K5, both would go their separate ways and develop their own processors. Despite all of this, AMD didn't just survive. The AMD 386 was a huge success, running at up to 40 MHz, when Intel's fastest 386 ran at only 33 MHz. Prices also dropped and the 386DX40 offered amazing value. Performance in games is decent, you can run a wide range of games. Even early 3D games run fine on a 40 MHz 386. For example, Wolfenstein 3D, that's a classic, really playable on this computer. So is Stunts, a racing game, also runs very smooth on this machine. And even a little bit more modern games like Ultima Underworld are perfectly playable. It's only when you get to games such as Doom, where the performance is not that great anymore and you have to uh, lower the resolution or drop down the details. So the 386DX40 from AMD encapsulates the little guy outdoing a much bigger opponent. And so in today's video, we are celebrating AMD's achievements and taking a close look at the AM486DX40. Here we have two of these processors. You have a choice, they come in a ceramic casing or like this one with a plastic cover. The processors come for sockets, so they are actually removable. But on many motherboards, especially later value motherboards, the processor can also be found soldered directly onto the motherboard. On this mainboard, the clock speed can be configured by changing the quartz crystal. So this one runs at 80 megahertz and half the clock speed is used to clock the processor. So that's 40, but I can use a different one. This is one uh, is a 66 megahertz uh, crystal. And if I install this, the processor will run at 33 megahertz. And even turning on the machine and running the memory test, we can tell the difference in clock speed. This is the mainboard we're using for our testing today. This is actually a hybrid motherboard. Not only does it support 386 processors, you can also install 486 CPUs. So this was definitely one of the later motherboards and for testing a 386, this motherboard is very fast. So let's take a closer look. Here we can see the memory modules. I'm using four modules with one megabyte each. So the total capacity is four megabytes. And for the games that run well on a 386, this is all you need. The 386 processors do not have any cache. So on these older motherboards, the cache was actually uh, implemented as having memory chips directly on the main board. And this being a late motherboard, it supports actually 256 kilobytes of cache. And that is a huge amount for a 386. Usually they have 64 kilobytes or 128 kilobytes. So in terms of performance, um, having 256 kilobytes of cache definitely improves the result. Here we have the chipset, so this one is a implementation from Forex. Here we have the keyboard connector and you can just use one of these adapters. It converts to PS2 and then you can plug in 
a standard PS2 keyboard. This mainboard is too old to support the ATX standard, so this uses the older AT connector, but you can get an adapter. So this one plugs into the motherboard and converts to ATX. So you can plug in a modern power supply and it also comes with a power switch to turn on your machine. Power consumption is also extremely low. The entire test system we're using today consumes only 26 watts when playing a game. So that's including the sound card and the I.O. controller as well as all the storage devices. Here we can see all the front panel connectors. Very interesting is the turbo. So I have a jumper here that's permanently closed so the machine runs at full speed. But if you remove that, the machine will be slowed down. So this is useful for running older software that runs too fast on a 386 with 40 megahertz. Here we have a graphics card. It's none other than the Tsang ET4000. This is a real classic to be paired up with a 386. It is pretty much one of the fastest video card for DOS gaming and with the ISA interface. And if you pick a slow video card, you can definitely tell on a 386. Here we have the I.O. controller. This is a Gold Star Prime 2. We've got a serial and a parallel port, but also uh, headers here for another serial and also for a game port. Unfortunately, although the controller has jumpers to turn off some of the resources, there doesn't seem to be a jumper for the game port. So I had to disable the game port on the sound card. And here we attach the storage. So the floppy drive goes here and the hard drive goes here. For storage, I like using either of these two devices. So these are adapters. This one here converts from compact flash to IDE, and this one converts from SD cards to IDE. Both of these are perfect candidates for a 386. I, uh, in previous videos, I used the compact flash cards, but more recently I've switched over to using SD cards. The cards are just readily available. I can just buy them in the supermarket over the counter. Whereas the compact flash cards, they are more special items which I have to order in. In terms of performance, the compact flash cards do have faster transfer rates. Uh, the SD card solution tops out at around 25 megabytes per second or something like that. But for a 386, this isn't an issue. The IO controller is not capable of reaching either of these limits. If you're building an authentic 386, you will likely have a five and a quarter inch and a three and a half inch floppy disk drive. Many years ago, I started using these GoTech floppy emulators instead, simply because I had too many reliability issues. Uh, a lot of my floppy disks over time, they would just yeah lose information and not be usable anymore. So this has definitely helped me out and more and more people are using this for reliability purposes. Setting up the software is pretty straightforward. I downloaded the MS-DOS 6.22 boot disk from bootdisk.com. Then I booted from it, partitioned and formatted the hard drive. There is a 512 megabyte uh, capacity limitation in place with these old 386 computers. Then I copied the DOS files across. And the second disk I needed is my DOS starter pack. You just run install and it copies a few files across. It will give you a boot menu with different RAM configurations as well as a working mouse and optical drive. For this project, I'm not using an optical drive. I simply ejected the SD card, put it in a card reader on my modern computer and I copied all the games across that way. And we need a sound card and there are lots of options. In my opinion for 386, the Sound Blaster Pro 2 is a really good choice. This is the CT1680. This is an OEM version of the Sound Blaster Pro 2 and didn't even have to install any drivers, didn't even have to set up the set blaster environment variable. All the games picked it up automatically and it sounds really nice. Beyond a regular sound blaster, it will become expensive. But if you want the ultimate experience and you want to choose the Roland option in many of the games, there's no way around a Roland MT32. Not only will you need this unit, you will also need a MPU 401 MIDI adapter. But for this video, we will keep it simple. We will stick with the classic sound blaster. 
And of course, I couldn't help it, I had to run a few benchmarks. So a while ago, I put together a DOS benchmark pack. I put a link down below in the description. You can download that. It's got a really simple menu. So first up, we got 3D Bench, and I tested this mainboard with the processor clocked at 25, 33, and 40 megahertz. And we're getting 10.9, 14, and 16.1 in 3D Bench. The BIOS defaults have been loaded, no tweaking. You can extract a little bit more performance out of such a machine by overclocking the ISA bus but I simply loaded the BIOS defaults. We got another benchmark, this is Doom. Now I configured this with the lowest details, so uh, pressing F5 to lower the graphic details as well as reducing the window size to the smallest option. With the 25 megahertz machine we're getting 18.3, 24, 40, 33 megahertz, 386 and the 40 megahertz machine gets 28.2. In top bench, we're getting scores of 66, 80, and 91. And I also ran Speedsys 5.87, 7.83, and 9.39. And now we're going to have a look at some games. This is on the 386 running at full speed. I will put the game title down below. I tested around 15 games, so let's have a look. Humans will survive.
So guys, the AMD 386 running at 40 megahertz. What a cool retro CPU. And yeah, uh, look back at a time when AMD built faster processors compared to Intel. Not just on the 386, even on the 286, they had uh, the processor running at 20 megahertz. Intel topped out at 12.5. And on the 486, Intel went up to 100 megahertz, whereas AMD went to 133. So different strategies. AMD stuck with the existing processors for longer and improved them in terms of clock speed, whereas Intel uh, abandoned a platform quicker and tried to move onto a new platform, making people upgrade to the latest and greatest. Building a 386 can be a lot of fun and straightforward if you pick the right parts and also if you make sure that you get documentation or if you find existing documentation on the internet. There's nothing worse than getting a motherboard with a ton of jumpers and no manual um, and then it gets difficult. Most of the jumper positions they are written on the PCB but this is not always the case. In terms of games you can run on this machine, up to early 3D games there is a wide range. Now we are a little bit limited in terms of the speed, so we either have full speed or with the turbo button engaged, um, a slightly slowed down version which usually performs on the level of a 286 or 386SX, so that's useful for older games. But uh, it has to be said, compared to a 486 or Pentium MMX, the 386 has a very narrow window of uh, what sort of games you can play. Uh, still, I believe owning a 386 is definitely something special. There's just something really cool about the simplicity of such a setup. And yeah, games, they just work. You have uh, awesome compatibility, uh, provided of course you, you, you get decent components like a sound blaster and yeah, decent motherboard, but very likely you might actually not have too many choices. Some of these parts are becoming quite difficult to obtain. So if you're looking for a 386 mainboard, um, you might not have too much of a choice. So uh, it might be a situation where whatever you have, you will uh, make the most of it. So guys, I really enjoyed working with the 386 once again. Uh, the game's definitely triggered some old memories and I had a good time, that's for sure. Now, do let me know what is your opinion about the 386 um, in terms of uh, retro gaming now, but also back in the day. Did you have one? What sort of 386 did you have? Did you have an SX or did you go with Intel? Uh, really interested to hear your thoughts. And as always, uh, with the retro stuff, do let me know what sort of projects you want to see. I do read every comment and I do my best to make it happen. And regarding retro content, just a comment uh, because I get the odd comment about when are you going to do retro videos again. Um, I will always do retro videos. Um, my heart is definitely uh, in that era. Uh, however, my interests do change and if something um, yep, comes into my lap that really interests me, then I'll do videos on that. So basically, um, I do listen to all the comments. But in the end of the day, I have to be passionate about it. I'm not doing videos just to get the views or to keep people happy. I think you'll just burn out sooner or later if you do that. But I will always do retro videos, maybe not as frequently as in the past, but um, retro content will never go away from this channel. So just be patient and do uh, have a look at some of the more modern videos. I believe they are interesting, some of the uh, Xeon stuff and also now the first generation Ryzen CPUs. This is also something that interests me a lot. And that's it guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video and you haven't subscribed, please do so. Give it a like, share it with your friends and that's it. Thank you for watching. I shall see you soon with another one.